Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to Raw Pods, Conversations in Creative Ideas and Expression, hosted by Rawani. We are launching Series 2 of our podcast. This is the first episode in the series and we are honored to have with us today Professor Vakas Khwaja. It is immensely difficult to do justice to the introduction of somebody as well qualified and with as versatile a skill set and achievements as his. Uh, but for the sake of today, I will try to do my best to introduce him. Uh, professor Vakas Khwaja is a professor of English literature in the US. He specializes in the areas of Victorian literature, British Romanticism and post-colonial literature. He also teaches courses in creative writing. He's published a number of articles on a varied amount of subjects and he has edited anthologies of Pakistani literature, uh, you know, translations, poetry and fiction. Uh, and he's done these translations from Urdu and Punjabi into English. So with his very diverse background, he will be speaking to us today about the very important subjects of literary preservation and innovation. So thank you very much, Professor Vakas Khwaja, for taking our time to be with us here today. Yeah, I think it's a huge topic and I'll just try to see if I can uh, give you some of the salient points that come to mind um, as you raise this question, a very significant one in its own right. Um, what we have uh, is, um, in fact, as you rightly pointed out, an infiltration of the social media, which gives, I believe, a distorted picture of what the actual situation may be in, in societies um, uh, themselves. Yes, there's, there are changes. There's no question about it as well. But it, it may be a bit of a refraction of what the, uh, the actual situation might be rather than a, a true image of it. So whether it is auditory learning or hearing uh, as we talk about uh, or it is a visual representation these two modes of communication do a whole lot but writing uh, is a beast apart if you will put it that way if I can use a cliche of sorts um, it, it is quite a chimerical sort of um, uh, medium um, of communication and why do I say that because it engages the imagination in ways that the visual uh, and the auditory may not have uh, the ability to do to do so and 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 that means that you have to imagine things which you can't see you have to imagine things which you can't hear uh and when you are forced to do that you are engaged it seems to me more fully your mind certainly is engaged in reading the text on the page parsing it finding the meaning or coming to a meaning and that's a very sort of it's a complex process but it's a quick process as well it happens you know pretty much as as you learn to read it happens pretty quickly for uh, for most readers the other part of course is that you're now imagining uh, the situation as much as it is described and we found in writing understatement works a whole lot because once again it is trying to engage the reader more fully in the process of creating the experience that the text is talking about. But when you show a person on the screen itself or in a visual image, or when you hear something, you cannot move away from that, from, from, from the representation of that, both visually and in terms of the auditory experience. And the imagination is much less engaged um, in creating or recreating the experience of the text as it is. So what am I saying here? I mean, I, I think partly um, people who continue to read actually will find that that experience is far more enriching than simply um, hearing audiobooks. Uh, I, I think that makes absolute sense. Um, how, uh, you know, we say people who really enjoy reading a book, when they actually see that redeveloped into a movie, there's always a lot of disappointment, right? Because there's that yeah. creative license at play and yeah. you kind yeah. of lose that when you're consuming, um, you know, art in other, uh, me you know, uh, in other media form. Uh, but having said that, we are also starting to see that in the UK, for example, there are universities that are 
uh, considering dropping their art, arts related and even literature related courses uh, because of employ employability considerations right again you know this would not be the oxbridges but it would be um, you know univers universities that are catering to people um you know to the middle class and so on for whom employment and you know uh financial viability of a subject that they're studying is really important um how uh, you know given your experience working in the US and also uh you spent time in Pakistan and so on how do you see that trend playing out in future okay again there are a few uh important um I would say uh, flashpoints, or there are a few imp important currents that are at odds with each other, have been at some time uh, for some time, but they are coming more to the forefront now. And I think you rightly mentioned the whole idea of education for its own sakes. Uh, education for its own sake has has been assailed so much that people have come to to have grave doubts about it because precisely of the employability uh, issue employability actually translates into economic advantage so what we are talking about here is then that a university degree should be a certificate for you to be able to earn money and education was never meant to be that way in the classical sense of the term education was meant for its own sake for this just becoming a better person becoming a more informed person and therefore leading a richer life and being a richer person of communication with other people as well so you drop that and what do you have in the universities you have either technical education uh, and in many ways think about it whether we are talking of uh, the medical uh, sort of uh, profession or we are talking about uh, physics and chemistry etc a lot a lot a lot of them are heavily based on the technical aspects of of learning i'm not saying that there's no imagination involved here but a lot of them are based upon that and these will lead you to an employment chemistry botany zoology you know these kinds of subjects because they are business these are there are jobs open uh, for you there you can have your own initiative and in business and start your own business and start earning money the emphasis on money 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 all the time is what it is so that has turned the university into a corporation uh, unfortunately uh, the united states uh, is showing uh, the, the grave deleterious effects of that already uh, a lot of the universities here in order to keep themselves afloat i mean they don't no, no longer have the colonies or other countries in the world to rob as as, as you know as as nonchalantly as they used to do in the past so obviously they need to raise money to run these universities so now it is all about you know technical education making the university financially viable you can't get the aid from the government and so on and where does the government get the money from and so on and so forth so you have the university and the educational institutions the higher education institutions being run as corporations and you have the administrators being focused upon the president and the vice president and so on as opposed to the faculty which really make the university what it is so that's that's one aspect so then there is this this clash between and i think this is largely um, uh, concocted a clash by the administrators and by by the corporate uh, sector this clash between the liberal arts and humanities on the one hand and sciences on the other so stem subjects stem subjects all the time because they'll get you the jobs they'll get you into a position where you'll immediately start earning money well the universities and the colleges are, have also raised their tuitions the cost of education so much that it has become impossible for the ordinary person you talk about the middle class what what about the the huge mass of people below the middle class or actually you know in the, at the lower level of the middle class there's no way for them to afford not even for the middle class to afford let's say a tuition of anywhere from 50,000 to 70,000 dollars a year mm -hmm. uh which is what we have here in in the United States plus another 30 to 40,000 for board and lodging uh, and then you have books and so on for four years to get an undergraduate degree so legitimately the people are asking this question but though the question is legitimate you can see how the emphasis on economics on the one hand and technical education on the uh, on the other hand employability that is on the other hand this itself is the problem this is the, it itself is what needs to be addressed why is an enlightened society anywhere or a prosperous society anywhere 
constructed or structured in such a way that it makes it impossible for people or the, you talk about democracy on the one hand impossible for ordinary people to have a decent education only the children of the very rich can have an education without uh, without loans so every undergraduate that graduates at this undergraduate level uh, gets a ba degree every one of them comes out with a loan of anywhere from $70000 to $150000 and then if you want to go to professional schools there are mm-hmm. more loans to be taken out and this is the way capitalism works we are told oh, everyone yeah. for themselves individuality and so on so i'll stop here just to sort of give you an idea this is this is the scene this is actually more like a scene of conflict a scene of war that is going on uh with weapons that are very different from guns but they are as dangerous uh if not even yeah. more dangerous for 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 humanity at large you know uh, the current system of education was founded at the time of the industrial revolution um right where everybody was at least in the uk what we see with the schooling system it was created to uh, cater to you know the economic needs of society as opposed to you know a more holistic kind of education where uh you know people learned about different subjects their interests and you kind of rewarded that and you know allowed them to pursue a line um and an area of study that was of interest to the child right and we are um we had uh, this uh this speaker and researcher sir ken robinson and he spoke to how creativity in schools you know is starting to uh well schools aren't uh, simply focusing on the area of creativity and literature of course is a uh you know an area within that uh and his studies and research were very interesting and you know he had spoken about how we reward skills and behaviors that you know not everybody necessarily has the personality for and in doing so uh, the education system is actually penalizing the more creative minds right uh, so there's of course the, there's a learning aspect to what you've mentioned and there's a creativity aspect and a critical thinking um learning from the past you know because literature tell stories from multiple disciplines whether it be history you know the sociological issues or whatever it was at that time even at a political level people learn from literature so i agree with most of what you have said except that you know i think the current system of education that we have goes back much further it goes back to the renaissance the renaissance it could go back to the classical times and so on but in the renaissance in particular when the idea of liberal arts and humanities studying uh for its own sake was was um uh was instituted as an academic practice it was done through the church so what i'm trying to say is that we need to understand even the very foundations of what we call liberal arts and humanities for them to be relevant to us in this world for them to to be understood as subjects that are necessary not only for decent living or good and enriched living but also the, as the foundations of society the idea that the liberal arts and humanities as configured comes from the christian church which it does despite all the disclaimers you'll have plenty of histories that are testifying that comes from the from from the church comes from the west comes from the europe means that we are denying all the developments and evolutions that may have occurred in countries and regions like china for instance the middle east for instance or africa where other forms of knowledge and other views by the way of liberal arts and the humanities exist as well apart from sciences too so actually the system goes back much further when we talk about it and the problems with this system need to be identified and understood why because unless we identify those uh, difficulties and 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 those prejudices that underlie that formation we will not be introducing a new voice in the conversation we will we will not evolve this this idea further it is not as if suddenly somebody discovered in the renaissance the key to all mm-hmm. kinds of knowledge and all kinds of ills in the world the enlightenment itself has caused so many wars and such desecration of human rights that we need to relook at that as well so we we are talking of something very fundamental here across the world across the globe without being only localized by the way in terms of being caught in our own religion or in our own culture etc there are many ways of configuring this world we should know that the world is wide and diverse and this helps us we are also told this helps us to understand each other 
but if we are going to erase these cultural differences and diversities that there that exist and create a mickey mouse mcdonald culture across the world the homogeneity of so called false globalization or cosmopolitanism then we are in serious trouble and which is why this uh, forum of yours appeals to me a whole lot because this is about preservation and conservation of ways of looking that we may have lost i'll say one other point and then uh, defer and see if you have a, a, any other comments uh, and of course uh, any other questions that arise as well and 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 this is related to 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 this idea that somehow or the other uh, this this whole movement uh, is is caused by industrialization and industrialization uh, this movement towards wanting employability and technical skills etc yeah. and th- therefore mm. this needs to be um, uh, addressed or perhaps industrialization is bad at some point the other party saying it is good that's not at issue at all actually what is at issue here is that industrialization for the needs of the society itself rather than for the global market we have been forced over and over again across the world countries that have been colonized by the french by the germans by the british you name it and this neo colonialism by america we've been forced by all of them to produce goods for what is known as the global market which benefits the few and impoverishes the other uh, you know the masses the people in general and this kind of robbing is i think uh, this is robbery this is robbery just as colonialism was robbery yes. um so this kind of robbery needs to stop as well and we need to stand up against it identify it point out uh, the problems and uh, see what the way forward may be yeah i think you've raised some really really good and uh, valuable points so we had and i think uh, you know i could identify quite a few on which we could have uh, a very detailed discussion uh, just to summarize um i think two of the points that you've raised about uh the kind of robbery there is i think we could classify it, classify it as economic robbery as well as intellectual robbery right we've seen both and um just to speak to what's currently pa- happening in pakistan for example with you know no corporations really set uh, stepping up to help pakistan unfortunately uh, you know with the floods and everything uh it is quite tragic that we're already seeing the worst effects of it um your point about the intellectual robbery and uh, you know the narrative being a more western probably colonially uh dominated narrative that you know we still have today how do you think it's good for i mean what do you think is the right way for cultures to kind of come together and start communicating in a better way where you know every culture is for boys and you know traditions uh, you know and i speak of literary and intellectual traditions how can we give space to each of them so that reduces the conflict well and i think that is the seminal question that is the foundational question that all societies uh, need to resolve and find an answer to for themselves uh we are all thinking about it we've all uh, you know a lot of people are thinking about it uh, a lot of people are also writing about it and i would say that yes you know i have certain ideas that i would offer here uh w- w- with absolute modesty by the way in the sense that these are ideas to start us talking about things rather than feeling that okay this is an authoritative and final program and this is how it should be looked at but th- th- these are ideas to think about the way i see it is that at the heart of all of this is the clamping down on people in f- enforced uh, sort of uh, uh, application of foreign languages for instance like english french german all the colonial languages are so clamped down on formerly colonial territories that the elite of those population or what people who are considered the elite of those populations end up actually not only learning those languages finding uh, expertise or or fluency in those languages and then going to the foreign countries and actually working for the very machinery for the very systems that are exploiting their own societies they are exploiting their own countries there is the need at the heart then of all of this to have these languages to give these languages the space to breathe so they can exist the argument for them 
to exist is the same. Each language that is lost means that you have lost a way of looking at the world which was different from that which another language had or with which other languages have. So that is one thing. We should be as concerned about the loss of languages because it brings a whole worldview uh, uh, into the mix which will be lost if if the if that language uh, is lost uh, and, and it is important for us to continue to understand and and to move forward with that diversity that human beings in their own regions in their own areas have developed so what that means is the translation becomes crucially important to this task as well how do you preserve a language you don't preserve a language just in the past just out of, you know, every language has their past icons, cultural icons, the great poets, the great writers or the great thinkers, and they have their certain idiom, their language. But if the, if the evolution or development of the language have, has been interrupted, let's say by colonialism or several forms of colonialism over the centuries, then what do we need to do? Try to resurrect the old language, which will no longer be valid for the new world that we are living in. We have to live in this new world as well. So translating from other languages that have the expertise in subjects like the sciences, for instance, uh, subjects like uh, you know physics, chemistry, mathematics, etc., uh, including business, but also ha have the expertise in philosophy, anthropology, archaeology, etc. Translate the seminal texts into these languages to enlarge the vocabulary of these languages. You know, it's all very good to translate a poet into the English language. It goes back or into the French language. It goes back to the same reservoir that is exploiting us. And they're saying now we've got, you know, all the Indian languages translated into uh, into English. Now we have all the sort of uh, Gakuyan language, uh, sort of Nigerian culture or Ken Kenyan culture translated into into this language. This is not this is not uh, an answer to the problem. So one way of doing this is for instance that the translation of important educational texts should be important education can only then happen in these languages and the vocabulary of these languages will be enlarged and they will become meaningful for us again i think this is also an economic issue partly because if we learn gikuyu for instance there's no money in it right if we learn Rajasthani, there's no money in it. If we speak Punjabi or write in Punjabi, no matter how well we write, we're not part of you know the cosmopolitan conversation. This is not how it should be, but we have to make it possible that this, this happens. And so this kind of translation will certainly help. Also, the translation should not only be done in those so-called you know, great languages of the world that have evolved through all forms of exploitation of other peoples and other languages, but the translation should also occur between these languages themselves. So translating something that is in Rajasthani or Punjabi into Kannada, for instance, or translating it into Gakuyu or translate it, translating it into one of those languages that are vulnerable and threatened today in the world would make a lot of sense also would create a community of people who are also sort of doing a lot of um, uh, soul searching regarding the erasure of their culture, their history, their identities uh, by uh, by the neo-colonial sort of structures that we have in the world. The other, I feel, very important point over here is that mostly when we see these translation and preservation activities happening it is you know in the west in english speaking countries that already have you know a good reservoir of literature and translation with them um having said that i think those are also the countries you know coming back to the whole economic argument those are also the countries that have right um to un undertake such activities which perhaps developing countries uh, lack at a professional level and you know, during all of this, uh, you know, whilst you were speaking, as well as during the course of being involved in Ravani's activities and being uh, trying to uh, participate in events and initiatives in the UK as they happen. And I speak of, you know, a Western culture. You know, what I see happening in Europe is a lot of community related activity, right? So they don't just leave it to professional and artistic organizations. There is a lot of work going on in every community, in every neighborhood. Uh, you know, there are community groups that are getting together to recite poetry. There are charity organizations that are dedicated to working with university setups and so on uh, in order to start, uh, in order to further the work of preservation of art. 
you know across cultures and for me i feel like this is work that uh, you know needs to happen from a pakistani community perspective right we have a very very rich tra- uh, literary tradition that is largely lost because of you know the post colonial um problems that we face right we've had a we've had a partition half of our literature has been left on one side uh, you know the other half is with us is it being preserved and taught in the right way or not um academia is it you know entirely free from uh you know free to teach what it needs to teach you know those are questions that need to be asked and um also one final point over here to your point about the elite speaking the english language and more colonial languages that's another problem that we have we have um you know two very different groups in pakistan who speak very different languages uh who consume different literature and who perhaps need to be talking and interacting more with each other so you know i'll just get your thoughts on how from a pakistani perspective we need to be looking at this whole preservation piece so i'll take the last point first about pakistanis okay. and the divides that exist in that society uh between people speaking various languages yeah. there are uh the provincial and regional languages there is urdu as the national language there is english as the official language um a, sta- a very very sad state of affairs when you think about it because uh there are levels of exploitation that people see that we may not be able to perceive um if we if we pretend that we are looking at it objectively and neutrally to to give you an example a sindhi or a balochi or a, a pathan and even a punjabi and often a punjabi too yes may feel that urdu itself is an exploitative colonial language that is imposed upon them in order to uh, suppress their languages uh, and then of course you have english at the top of it so what we are talking of so getting back to the idea of what i mentioned uh, uh, at the conclusion of my last set of comments is the translations occurring between languages that are themselves threatened actually revive those languages as well but there are there are, there has to be a whole regimen regarding this you just can't wish this to happen and and it will happen and this brings me to the crucial point that um you have raised up regarding european support and organizations and so on and so forth um and and uh, which i wanted to listen to very carefully because i missed part of it when uh, when the sound went out uh because at some level i find it if you i hope you don't mind this but if you yeah, mind it fine. please understand that i'm not saying it in any inimical way but don't you feel offended when that happens is europe yeah. going to preserve my language and my culture is europe going to preserve nigerian languages and kenyan languages and african languages and middle eastern languages and so on and we are to be beholden to them for doing that and then those languages will live of course not when you talk about preserving or conserving languages you are talking of preserving and conserving them like exotic plants or seeds you're not talking them we're yeah. talking about preserving them as living languages and the living yeah. languages can only be meaningful can only truly live and be preserved if the people who speak them have enough mm-hmm. faith in them have enough passion about them are doing everything to actually make them work for them in the changed world that exists so this is yeah. not a european problem this is not an english problem this is not an american problem a lot of translations happen here as well and you know very expensive translation texts are produced and and published and so on but they are meant for the consumption of the academia meant to sort of show that we are really concerned about the rest of the world and this is how we preserve them ultimately to clamp a kind of a hegemony over the rest of the world i don't see this as yeah. necessarily an act that is useful for our languages of our for our cultures that can only happen when people who speak those languages are actually concerned about and doing the work not just concerned about and doing the work to make those languages live one last point here i want to bring up regarding mm. uh, the pakistani uh, side of the we are talking about this a lot of uh, you know all of you in fact are uh, of pakistani origin and so i think uh, it's something to think about something to worry about also i would say 75 yeah. years of our existence um 
how many of our sort of legal codes are in english uh, sorry are, are in urdu is our constitution in urdu or is it in english what kind of a country are we if we call ourselves an independent country with where urdu is i'm just talking of urdu here and forgetting about all the other sort of controversies around that we have uh, none of our rules none of our law courts conduct their business in in, in urdu our constitution constitution is not in urdu our laws are not in urdu we don't sort of produce or promulgate laws in this language in our national language and we uh, think this is okay and of course we can go ahead and translate all kinds of texts in, in the urdu science board and and the translation centers and this and that but but really the very basic a uh, step that needs to be taken for people to be actually conversing each other about issues and about their ways of living in their own language and having laws that they can understand in their own languages rather than in english I mean, we haven't done that in 75 years when are we going to start and by, by the way this is an affliction that runs across what you would call the so called post colonial world with colonial mm-hmm. world really countries that have been colonized i think that is absolutely very well said we need to have this awareness you're absolutely right um in raising the point about you know us not leaving this to the europeans or to anyone else to do and that it's quite ironic that you know th- that preservation work is happening uh in the part of the world that has colonized the rest of it you know um so i absolutely agree with you and i think the intention over here is to ultimately start to understand what we need to be doing as a community and not just to be reliant on others but to use uh but to learn from the best of uh, or perhaps to learn from the work that's happening in other countries and to start implementing it locally so in the same way and if you will permit me agar main yahan pe uh, urdu mein bhi baat kar lu तो इसी तरफ मैंने इसी इशू की तरफ मैंने इशारा किया था इसी मसले की तरफ इशारा किया था जब मैंने ये बात की थी कि पाकिस्तान के अंदर किस किस्म की दराड़ें पड़ी हुई हैं लासानी हवाले से लेकिन इसके बावजूद ये किसकी जिम्मेदारी है कि तराजम जो हैं कम से कम उन डॉक्यूमेंट्स के जैसे कि कानूनी डॉक्यूमेंट्स हैं उनके कम से कम उर्दू में किए जाए और वो तराजम जो हैं वो लोगों को जो है उनको उस तक उनकी पहुंच हो क्योंकि हमारी पहुंच भी नहीं है जाहिर अगर वो है ही नहीं वो दस्तावेज मौजूद ही नहीं है तो उन, उन तक हमारी पहुंच कहाँ कहाँ से आएगी तो ये किसी ने तो काम तर्जमे का करना था किसी ने नहीं किया पचहत्तर साल हुए हम बड़ी बातें करते हैं हम अपने आप को बहुत आगे समझते हैं कल्चर में एटसेट्रा लेकिन अब एक और बात भी है सोचने की और वो ये है कि पार्टीशन के फौरन बाद जो जनरेशन थी जिसमें मैं भी हूँ उस जनरेशन में हमारी भी इसी तरह तालीम अंग्रेजी मीडियम स्कूलों में हुई थी और हमें भी ये था कि जो आपने बिल्कुल उर्दू नहीं बोलनी एक घंटे का एक एक पीरियड होता था जो एक हफ्ते में हम उर्दू सीखने के लिए करते थे एक घंटे का एक पीरियड बट वही था और ऐसे हमारी कोई और जबान मौजूद ही नहीं है और इस तरीके से हमारी हमारी तालीम हुई लेकिन ठीक है हमारे साथ हुआ कोशिश हमने की जो ये जो बात करते हैं ना हम के एक एक इंटेलेक्चुअल रॉबरी जो भी हमने बात की है वो ये भी तो है ना कि एक सिस्टम जो अंग्रेज पीछे छोड़ गया हम उसके साथ इस तरह अटैच हैं कि अब ना सिर्फ वो हमने जो है अडॉप्ट कर लिया बल्कि हम अमेरिका के सिस्टम भी और और भी जो वेस्टर्नाइज सिस्टम है वो अडॉप्ट करने के लिए तैयार है अपना सिस्टम डेवेलप करने के लिए हम तैयार नहीं ंगो जो है जो कि कैनियन राइटर है उसने बड़ी जबरदस्त इसके ऊपर अपनी एक उसकी किताब है डी कॉलोनाइजिंग द माइंड और समलरेडी रेड दैट बुक उसने इसकी तरफ इशारा किया और जो सेमिनल मोमेंट था उसके लिए वो अंग्रेजी में लिखता है और लिखता था लेकिन अब वो अपनी सर्फ मादरी जबान में लिखता है और फिर उसका तर्जमा अंग्रेजी में करता था कि दोनों जुबानों में कम अज कम वो चीज जो है वो सामने आया तो उसका जो सेमिनल मोमेंट था जब वो यूनिवर्सिटी में पढ़ा रहा था तो तीन प्रोफेसरों ने मिलके एक जारी एक वो कैस का नाम है वो पब्लिश किया पैम्फलेट पब्लिश किया 
जिसके अंदर उन्होंने ये लिखा कि ये अंग्रेजी डिपार्टमेंट जो है ना डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश ये खत्म होना चाहिए ये टर्मिनोलॉजी गलत है डिपार्टमेंट डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ लिटरेचर करते ठीक है हम आजाद हो चुके हैं और अब अब हम हमारे लिए कोई सेंस नहीं है डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश लिटरेचर करें एक छोटी सी बात है ये लेकिन इसका इम्प्लीकेशन बहुत बड़े हैं इसका इम्प्लीकेशन ये जब डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ लिटरेचर करते हैं तो मैं अंग्रेजी अदब को भी अपने हवाले से देखूंगा ना कि मैं अपने अदब को अंग्रेजों के हवाले से देखूंगा सो वेन आई एम टॉट इंग्लिश लिटरेचर फ्रॉम द पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू ऑफ द ब्रिटिश आई एम रीडिंग देयर क्रिटिक्स आई एम रीडिंग देयर कल्चरल कॉमेंटेटर्स आई एम रीडिंग देयर पीपल देयर फिलोसफर्स एक्सेट्रा देन आई टेंड टू लुक एट माई कल्चर एज अ स्ट्रेंजर आई टेंड टू लुक एट माई कल्चर एज एन आउटसाइडर मुझे उसमें ये भी फ्लॉ और वो भी फ्लॉ नजर बिकॉज आई हैव नॉट लिव दैट कल्चर फ्लॉज हर कल्चर में है लेकिन हर कल्चर के अंदर मैकेनिज्म भी है उन फ्लॉज को कॉम्बैट करने का जो एकदम खत्म नहीं होते अंग्रेज जब सब कॉन्टिनेंट में आया था या जब उसने स्टैब्लिश की थी अपनी कॉलोनाइजेशन दुनिया के ऊपर तो उनके सारे प्रॉब्लम्स तब भी खत्म नहीं हुए थे आज भी खत्म नहीं है दे वेरी एविडेंट आज तो हम सब जो क्वीन मर गई है उसके लिए रो रहे हैं कि जी क्वीन किसकी क्वीन है उसके जितना उसके पास पैसा है जिस किस्म की वो ऑपुलेंट लाइफ गुजारती थी उसी ने तो दुनिया में ये ये सारी जो आप ट्रांसफरेंस ऑफ वेल्थ की बात कर रहे हैं ये कॉज की है she's a symbol of that but people don't see that you know a lot of people mm-hmm. who have been themselves affected by it will not see that this is unfortunate to wo wo baat jo hai ki ye transference jo hai is is transference mein humne kya khoya aur humne apne jo hai apne aap self reflection nahi ki apne upar nahi dekha apni culture ko nahi dekha wo chal raha hai hamari younger generation jo hai wo ab wo bhi angrezi medium schoolon mein padhti hai wo bhi angrezi mein एस्पायर करती है उसको प्राइजेस भी वो लेना चाहती है जो अंग्रेजी में मिलते हैं आपको प्राइज नहीं मिलेगा बाय द वे अगर आप इस कल्चर को क्रिटिसाइज करेंगे बट आप प्राइजेस के लिए लिखते हैं या आप जेन्यून अगर आप राइटर हैं तो आप इसलिए लिखते हैं बिकॉज ये आपके अंदर से कोई चीज आपको मोटिवेट करती है लिखने के लिए और आपकी कॉमेंट्री जो है वो सच के ऊपर बेस्ड है ना पे ना, ना के इस बात पे कि इस वक्त मुझे इसका ये फायदा हो I think it comes down to uh, you know when you live and interact with different cultures, uh, you start to think of things differently. You know, living in Pakistan, uh, all I heard growing up, and I know that the jo present day ki younger generation hai that's a lot more aware. Uh, but in my generation, the inter- everybody's focus was to get out of the country. Because our culture has flaws, and because our system has flaws. But you know, having lived in different countries and having worked across a number of cultures, uh, I know that every single culture has very massive flaws. But people take pride in their culture. You know, our uh, uh, when we criticize, we don't criticize for change. we criticize just to diminish our culture and over here i see the opposite happening so it is a point of learning that they criticize their government and their uh, you know their systems and policies uh, to enact change right so that's something uh, that's something that's very missing in our culture and i actually want to leave all of us with at least one thought here that i think all ills that exists in the world are the result of the failure of imagination aur iska matlab ye hai ki hame apne aap se bahar nikal ke apne self ki zaat se bahar nikal ke dusre ki zaat ke hawale se bhi sochna chahiye aur jab tak hum wo nahi soch sakte ab dusra chahe individual hai community hai society hai jab tak wo hum nahi kar sakte hamari wo zindagi ke andar wo empathy wo connectedness community ki jo connectedness hai wo nahi aayegi वो आएगी तो हमें अपनी जो हमारी अचीवमेंट्स हैं उनके ऊपर सही तौर पे फख्र भी होगा लेकिन हमें मॉडस्टी और हम्बलनेस भी होगी इस बात की कि और भी दुनिया में लोग हैं जिन्होंने बहुत बहुत काम किए हैं उनसे भी हम जैसे मुनीबा आपने कहा हम सीखने के लिए तैयार भी होंगे और हमें सीखना भी चाहिए ये भी सच है कि सारा इल्म का जो खजाना है वो मगरब में मौजूद नहीं है सिर्फ वो सारी दुनिया में डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड है और मगरब ने भी बहुत बोरो किया और हमने भी बहुत बोरो किया बोरो करने में कोई हर्ज नहीं है ये शो करता है कि हम सारे ह्यूमन एंटरप्राइज में जो जिसमें हम एग्जिस्ट करते हैं हम एक हैं इस ह्यूमन एंटरप्राइज में मैं इसको एक स्टेप आगे लेके जाऊंगा मैं कहूंगा जो ह्यूमन एंटरप्राइज है इट इज पार्ट ऑफ नेचर एंड वी आर पार्ट नॉट ओनली ऑफ दिस प्लान इन टर्म्स ऑफ 
all the existences that occur on this planet in its various forms and what not but also part of the cosmos so ye agar humme realization ho to hum jo hai na bigoted ho na pride hamare mein ho hamare mein bahut si learning capacities jo hai na wo ujagar ho jayenge thank you i think uh, couldn't have said it better uh, it points a uh, ek to there is a connectedness that runs between everybody and secondly not just literature but we as humans we continue to evolve so the learnings from the earlier part of the conversation i think what we need to be mindful of is hum kis tarah se evolve kar rahe hain are we letting one culture and one type of thinking dominate the narrative of you know our evolution or can we you know have a more balanced kind of conversation on this can we have a more balanced way of moving forward with this where we don't discount any any culture any tradition or any piece of literature and to or any innovation in that literature we need to be open to that as well uh, in order to take it forward so we need that openness in thinking and it starts with awareness and i hope that uh, you know everybody who's listening to this conversation at a later stage as well um can make the best of this awareness and move forward with it <laughs>